This is Giannis Gatsunas, host of Breaklines the Movie. I recently visited University of California, San Diego, to catch up with students there and discuss social justice. One student we caught up with was Logan, who participated in demonstrations around the time of George Floyd's murder. Our conversation was going smooth enough until we waded into the territory of regulating speech. Take a look, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, a lot of the people I've, I've, a lot of my friends from freshman year, like I said, come in and they completely change with this campus. Mm. I've completely changed with this campus. How have they changed? How have you changed? What is it about the campus that changes you? I'm now more willing to listen to any argument, opinion. Mm. I, I've kind of been taught by the program, by my peers, to really open my mind up to new perspectives mm -hmm. um, and really try to uh, empathize with people as much as I can before yeah. inserting my own opinion mm -hmm. or my own thoughts. What kind of uh, opinions have you been exposed to upon listening more? Uh, for example, um, I come from a conservative family. Based in? Uh, Palmdale. Okay, which is, is above, that California? Yeah, it's a California. It's above Los Angeles. It's a place where a lot of uh, flight tests is done. It's the middle of the Mojave yeah. Desert. Okay. Kind of town of conservative people. Um, and after coming here, I've realized, like, for example, the privileges I've had as someone who is white passing. You mm -hmm. know, I come from a Hawaiian family. Mm -hmm. um, privileges I've had, the opportunities I've had as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of had my mind open up to the reality of my situation a lot. Mm -hmm. What kind of privileges do you feel you have had that, say, somebody of a slightly darker skin tone, for example, might not? Uh, for example, uh, the uh, in high school I did a lot of robotics and engineering stuff like that. Mm. I was kind of all dominated by white guys, pretty much. Even at the school where we were like majority Hispanic. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until I was the captain of the robotics team where we actually got more people of color on. And that was because we kind of, the white guys kind of stayed to their own clique. Mm. And they didn't really want to branch out to any other races. More of like an implicit bias kind of thing. Mm. So coming here, I've realized the implicit biases I have in the ways in which I organize myself with other people um, and how that affects uh, people who are not in my in-group. So you did see evidence that people of white descent were systemically or systematically keeping people of color uh, from participating in these programs? Yeah, definitely. Mm. I mean, it's a long history, mm. you know. Um, but so I'm talking about the present day. Even yeah. the present day, I mean, yeah. as a result yeah. of the history, mm. um, they were never pushed in those opportunities mm. or um, even known those opportunities existed. Mm. So it was as, I guess, not um, by choice, but just as a result uh, implicit bias against those groups of people. Mm. Everybody has implicit biases. Yeah. And it's important for you to really self-reflect and understand the ways in which you treat people and treat situations as a result of your past. Mm. Um, I've gone, uh, it's like a metacognition kind of thing. When I go through a situation, I always try to step back and fully understand what the situation is. Try to leave my, my past mindset and just look at the facts, the logic, and try to understand what another person is going through or, you know, kind of zoom out from the situation instead of being stuck in my current mindset. Do you feel we sometimes miss what people are going through? In fact, maybe we miss what uh, we ourselves are going through because we are quick nowadays to filter it through uh, essentialist categories. So in other words, identify more as a group rather than an individual. Right, because your background is complex, as is mine. Right, my background—I'm I'm white by descent, but uh, I don't fit in neatly to a white box. And there does seem to be a push right now to encourage people to uh, see themselves through the lens of very broad categories. Um, does that encourage its own kind of implicit bias? Uh, definitely. Mm. Um, the when you compartmentalize a group of people like that, um, the, the result, I mean, is just building a a map of stereotype in your mind. Yeah. Um, there mm -hmm. are occasions where you need to uh, 
acknowledge the group they come from, um, to understand their background more. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. And one way, if you view them as a group, you can better understand the situation where they're coming from. So, so a group, let's say, uh, people who come from Mexico, mm -hmm. Um, we could all say, you know, they do this, this, and that. That would be, you know, a part of stereotyping. But if you understand that they come from a place in which there's a lot of, you know, uh, violence, um, gang warfare, stuff like that, yeah. then you can understand the mindset they have and the, um, the way in which they act as a result of that situation. All right. So it can be harmful, but, I mean, it is important to understand. You can't just say there is no race, you know. Huh. You have to acknowledge that, that is, there is a background to their race. You know. This the social justice movement at risk sometimes of overplaying the significance of race and other identity markers. You know, it's it's a it's a slippery slope kind of argument to say if it's too much or not. Um, so I wouldn't really know, but I do know mm. that, for example, like um, black people, a lot of them come from backgrounds of slavery, all their grandparents, etc., mm -hmm. and thus the opportunities they were given were not as great as the opportunities that I was given. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that's still true today, that blacks are not, give, that there's still some lingering systemic racism uh, that affects equal opportunity today? Definitely. And what um, evidence do you see of that? Uh, if you're asking for anecdotal evidence off the top of my head, mm. um, I've had uh, black friends through high school, incredibly smart men um, and great people who, as a result of their lineage, um, weren't able to, let's say, uh, go on field trips to meet people, to network with people. They weren't able to uh, uh, fully express who they could be. Because? Because they are, in a lot of ways, I, this is, I know I'm going to circle, systemically oppressed, but a lot of people still have implicit biases in their mind against these people of color. Is that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. So does implicit bias, is there any evidence to, to show that implicit bias leads to explicit bias? My understanding is that there's an industry of implicit bias and there's been some research that was done. Many of the studies that are cited are, were done 20, 30 years ago. And since then, a lot of academics and psychologists have gone through uh, this research and found huge holes in the whole premise of implicit bias and whether it reliably plays out the way the originators of these studies suggested that it did. Um, have you found evidence to the contrary or what's your, your perspective the, on that? It, it all depends. In, in terms of like the psychology of it and how much it affects it, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a psychologist, nor do I look at those papers. Mm -hmm. I do know the concept of implicit bias, right. and I can definitely recognize some within myself. Mm -hmm. There are implicit biases people have that can affect people. As a large, if you can say they all affect people, that is, you know, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, it's an, not a, a term to be understood psychologically. I think it's an individualist term huh. to try to understand yourself. Yes. Some studies show that context matters. So, for example, if you show a subject a picture of a black person uh, at church, uh, a church-going black person, the uh, connections they make would be much more positive than if you show the black person in a different context. Furthermore, some people apparently are conscious of their biases. So if, for example, it sounds like you're conscious or have become conscious of some of your biases, I would think as a result of that, that might prevent you from acting out in a particular way. Definitely. Mm. Um, and there's definitely still implicit biases I don't catch. You did have some black friends and you said you, you feel that maybe they were victims of, of um, some implicit bias. Uh, do you feel generally right now blacks are still treated I'm unequally? Black people, but okay. blacks well, I, is, I say blacks. For, that's uh, a, a historically, that's, that's getting to the terms of objectification of black people and I think that is yeah. a, a, a slippery slope to racism. So I'd rather not use that term, but um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Black people definitely, I, today, if every black person experiences systemic oppression uh, less than before, probably, mm. but there is still a large chunk of people in this country that have biases towards them. 
yeah. even if they don't recognize it, even if they don't know it. So you don't think there's equal opportunity for black people today? Or do you say black people? I say blacks. I say, for me, I, my language is much looser. So I say black people, blacks. Um, I might say African American sometimes. I don't really concern myself with those specifics. I recommend I feel not like... saying blacks. That is, like I said, an objectification. But um... no, but that's your recommendation, and I'm just saying very clearly that I don't abide by the imposition of any kind of language codes. In fact, I feel that becomes an impediment to substantive discourse, hmm. and in a free society, I feel that is, is somewhat different... offensive. They were right. dehumanized. So that, I, is, that can be viewed as a dehumanizing. It certainly could. It, it certainly could be viewed that way. But if I know in my heart I'm not dehumanizing them, then I'm not going to actually be caught up in the language but wars. But the way you speak is directly showing that you are dehumanizing. Even if you don't feel hmm. like you are, the way you speak is important, right? So it, what the words you say do have an effect on people, right. even if you're not intending that effect on people. And I think the way that I speak, I think what's really important is that I am actually focusing on being substantive as opposed to walking on eggshells for who I might offend. No, I understand. You know? and because I think that kind of gets in the way of building trust and rapport between communities. You know? So when people are like, oh my God, mind your P's and mind your Q's, you shouldn't say this and you shouldn't do that, actually becomes, you know, it, it actually becomes a barrier to thinking openly and having that free exchange of ideas. You can definitely think that. That is wrong. Yeah. Um, mm. The result of saying those kinds of things do hurt people in those communities mm. with those words. How do you how do you know that and what are you basing that on? I'm basing that on uh, the Have you spoken direct, to African Americans? Uh, like have you spoken to how many blacks have you spoken to that black share people. that that view? But I uh, enough plenty of people. Okay. I I'm not saying like I'm not Cuz I've spoken to a I number have a black friend, but right. what I'm saying is that just mm. in the terms of the the, the the style in which the language you are executing, the direct words you are saying, views them in the term of an object. That it's like saying, um, you know, uh, even just saying whites. That implies just the color and doesn't imply any huh. humanity behind it. You don't. You don't think it's just shortening a term for colloquialism's sake? Um, you're looking at it from an academic point of view, which I understand, mm. but. The better way to look at it is um, you need to set, put yourself in those people's shoes mm -hmm. and really try to understand how the words in which other people say affect you. Because you're allowed to have feelings. You're allowed to feel hurt by someone's words. So we should focus a lot on hurt feelings, in other words. Well, you're trying to get into the, the, the area of snowflake, and I understand that. But the... The feeling of people is important. You have feelings, and right. you, I'm sure, like if you and I'm of Greek, dis I'm of Greek descent, and people refer to the Greeks all the time, and I have chosen not to get triggered by this. I could, I could, in the name of hurt feelings, and I could feel very self righteous about it. Um, I could get all worked up and be a victim about it, and I could say, "Hey, somebody, please come to my rescue. I'm being dehumanized. I've chosen not to." I've always referred to them as. Do you, do you think it? Do you, but Greek people. Um, I actually I prefer the Greeks. Do you mind just referring to them as the Greeks? Uh, like I said, it's, it's an implicit bias. Mm -hmm. So just by saying that, you're thinking of it as an object instead of. Couldn't it just a be a custom of language and the way it's been used, and it's not necessarily connected to an implicit bias, which, by the way, as we mentioned earlier, stands on shaky ground to begin with. You know, um, as uh, like. In terms of just eth uh, in terms of morality and ethics, I think I'm going to treat people the best I can, mm -hmm. and the b best way I can do that is by providing the most empathetic language. And I you think you think empathy comes through being very sensitive to what kind of language you use around the person? Definitely. Um, I mean, because I've met black I've met black people who actually seem very uncomfortable with people. Uh, walking on eggshells around them and wondering whether this is the right or wrong phrasing I should use around this person. And I end up building a lot more rapport with them. And they've told me this, hey man, you're loose, you're, you're cool, we, we're able to talk. The formalities, the rituals that wokeism is insisting upon uh, is not present in this conversation. You know, so I'm wondering, like, like does it, can it become an impediment to actually being able to build rapport when you are formalizing your discussion with them. When it comes to building rapport, it all it's person to person. When mm. you're around me, I'd prefer you to say black people. Even though you're not 
the black person. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Being an extra mm -hmm. word, it does, only takes a half a second to say, and it makes everyone feel better. So right. why why try to like discern between the two? It, would it takes so little time to have a net positive. You say it, it actually makes everybody feel better. The only person I know who it's making feel better is you, but conversely, right, it's, a conversation with me. But conversely, it's not making me feel better when you're telling me that I should use your particular phrasings. It is a mistake. I have corrected your mistake. When you talk to me, you'll use that language. And that's okay. This is right. a, a form of boundary. This is right. a boundary. This is right. respect. I'm trying to respect you. Right. I'm trying to show you how to respect And you. my boundary and respect is you can use the terminology that you want, and I should be allowed to use the terminology that I want, and that's part of being a mature adult. Um, if you went on stage, if you were at one of my shows, if you were to say that, I would kick you off stage. Right, because there's a lack of tolerance. There's a lack exactly. of Exactly. You want people to adhere to your rigid standards. It's not my rigid standards. Right. It's the standards of society. It's not the standards of society because there's a lot of people who agree with me and disagree with you on this. That's why we're having this conversation. A lot of people don't agree on this matter. I understand it's, your perspective. Cool. I understand that it's, sometimes it can be hard to like change yourself based off of the want to accept people. It's, it's not about that. I think at the end of the day, you have to have tolerance for the fact that people are going to phrase things differently than you. And if people don't adhere to your standards, uh, they're not a bad person. You're they might have a very, they might have a very good reason for not adhering to your standards. And people are going to have different values than, than you. And I definitely more. respect bringing that out to me and mm -hmm. trying to open my mind, trying to open my opinion. And from what I understand about tolerance, that is the view that I have developed. Of course, does it matter as much as I'm trying to make it matter? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Um, is it for you or for me to say, we're white guys, we don't have that power. However, from what I've understood, that mm -hmm. is a better way to refer to people. Instead of risking the chance to objectify someone, make them feel bad by saying blacks, if I just say black people and keep it to that, I'm not going mm. to offend anybody. Mm. There's nobody who's offended by this. Do, do you see how insisting on use of particular phrases might make or is in fact making a lot of people feel very uncomfortable and has given woke ideology a bad name as a result. Referring to as woke ideology, I think brings it, uh, I think it already is an implicit bias against what I'm trying to say. But in terms of trying to make people comfortable, it's worth it.